This video is going to be looking at topic 2G, acids, bases and salt preparation as part of the double content for IGCSE chemistry. So we're going to be looking at a number of different learning outcomes, including the general rules for predicting solubility, how we explain acids and bases in terms of proton transfer, and also the reactions of hydrochloric, sulfuric and nitric acid with our metals, bases and metal carbonates in order to make salts as well as knowing the difference between bases and salts and being able to describe an experiment to prepare a pure dry sample of salt. So let's start off with what a salt actually is. Well, a salt is formed in the reaction between an acid and a base or in a neutralization reaction. So these are going to be neutral products, which means they're gonna have a pH of seven. Examples of salts are potassium nitrate, sodium chloride and ammonium phosphate. In order for us to know which type of salt we're going to make, well it's going to depend on the acid. We're going to make sulfate salt from sulfuric acid, we will make chloride salts from hydrochloric acid and nitrate salts from nitric acid. From acids, bases and titrations topic you should know the different formulas and you can see we've got some examples here of hydrochloric, nitric and sulfuric. Ethanoic is only going to be for triple students and phosphoric to make phosphate salts may come up but it is less likely to in the exam. So simple acids will react with metals depending on their position in the reactivity series and if you can't quite remember the reactivity series have a look over topic 2d. So any metals that are above hydrogen in the reactivity series will react, and if the metals are below hydrogen, they will not react. The higher the metal is in the reactivity series, the more vigorous the reaction is. So let's have a look at a reaction of a metal with acids. So we're going to look at magnesium. Magnesium is towards the top of the reactivity series, so it is going to react with sulfuric acid, and we're going to form a magnesium sulfate salt, and we're also going to form hydrogen gas. And remember, we can test for this because it is going to burn with a squeaky pop. And that will be in the chemical test section. Again, if you can't remember that, go and have a look over topic 2H. So this is a displacement reaction because the more reactive magnesium has displaced the hydrogen from our compound here to react with the sulfate. We can also have magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid in order to form magnesium chloride and again hydrogen. So we're making this salt here. Now we can write all of these equations as our ionic equations by only showing the ions that are reacting. So remember if it is an aqueous substance, it can dissociate into its ions. And when that happens, we can see which ones are going to be spectator ions. So in this case, it is our sulfate that are spectating. And we don't like to include spectator ions in our equation, so we remove them and we get the full ionic equation as shown here. We can get the same thing for hydrochloric acid, where we remove the chloride as our spectator ions. And again, we get the ionic equation to simply show the things that are reacting. So now we're going to look at the reactions of acids with bases. Well, there are two different ways that we can look at it. We can either have it looking at the reaction with alkalis, which are our soluble metal hydroxides, such as sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, or we can have it reacting with soluble or insoluble bases, which tend to be our metal oxides. But the most important thing is that in both, we form a salt plus water. So in the case that we see here, we've got copper 2 oxide reacting with sulfuric acid to give us the salt of copper sulfate and water of course. <clears throat> All metal oxides are going to react in the same way to form our salt and water. The main difference is that they require heat in order to start the reaction as opposed to alkalis which don't require any heat. If we have an insoluble metal hydroxide, we are also going to form a salt plus water. The biggest difference is when we have a metal carbonate where we get the salt plus water 
but we also get carbon dioxide gas being formed. And again, we can test this by checking the gas to see if it turns the lime water cloudy. Again, if you can't remember your gas test, go back and check topic 2H, which is our chemical tests. So to summarise our reactions, we have a reaction with a metal hydroxide, reactions with metal oxides, and reactions with metal carbonates, and these are just some examples. So when we're looking at salt preparation, there are a number of different rules that we have to learn. There are two ways that you can learn these. You can either learn the word or you can learn a diagram, which I'll show you in just a minute. <clears throat> so all of our sodium, potassium and ammonium compounds are all soluble. All of our nitrates are also soluble. With the chlorides, the majority are soluble, with the exception of lead chloride and silver chloride. And we know this because, again, it comes up in chemical tests as the test for halides. <clears throat> Sulfates are also soluble, with the exception of lead, barium, silver and calcium. Again, the barium being a chemical test, this time testing for sulfates. So we do know some of these already from topic 2H. The majority of our carbonates are going to be insoluble. The only exceptions being our sodium, potassium and ammonium because we've already said in the first rule that these are all soluble. The majority of our hydroxides are also insoluble, again with the exception of our three from rule number one, sodium, potassium and ammonium, and calcium hydroxide. It's slightly soluble in water. It's not fully soluble but it does have more solubility than something like magnesium. So we can also look at a diagram to show this and we can see that we again are all of our rules to show that our ammonium, potassium and our sodium are all soluble and all of our nitrates are soluble and we've got the key down at the bottom here to tell us which ones are completely insoluble and which ones have a slight solubility. So you can see that calcium hydroxide and calcium sulfate as well as silver sulfate are almost insoluble but they do have a slight level of solubility. Now for double students you are only required to know how to make insoluble salts that are not sodium, potassium or ammonium. These require titrations so they are triple only. Now the process that we do to, in order to make these salts is very much the same and we can see it's being summarised in this diagram here. So in here we're trying to make copper sulphate salts which are this lovely blue colour. We're going to have to react it with copper oxide with our sulfuric acid and we make our solution and we filter and then we undergo the um, crystallization process in order to saturate the solution and be left with our salt crystals. But let's go into a little bit more detail about how we do this. This very regularly comes up in exams and it can easily be a four or a five mark question. So in order to make our copper sulfate, we're going to heat some sulfuric acid, about 50 centimetres cubed, using a Bunsen burner. Now we don't want it to boil because we don't want it to be overflowing or causing any damage. Obviously, during this, we'll be wearing safety goggles and gloves to avoid any spillages. We want to add in copper oxide until it all dissolves, and then we want to make sure that we have some excess being left. So you would see that as a black powder at the bottom of the beaker. So when we see that, we know that we have reacted all of our possible copper sulfate, sorry, our copper oxide. So now we have to filter off that excess and then we get the filtrate being placed into an evaporating basin. So this should be our copper sulfate solution. And the problem is we want to get a pure dry sample. <clears throat> So in order to do that, we need to remove the water. So what we do is we heat the solution in order to boil off some of the water, not all of it. And we want to try to concentrate the solution. And in order to check for its saturation, we dip a glass rod into the solution. And once we start to see crystals being formed on the rod, then we know that we have a saturated solution. 
Once it is saturated, we then take it off of the heat and we leave it overnight or for a couple of days in a warm place in order for the mixture to cool slowly. That will then evaporate off the remaining water and we filter off any water that is left and we any insoluble sorry any other soluble impurities and we're left with our blue crystals that we then have to dry in an oven or we can pat them dry with filter paper. Magnesium sulfate is very much the same way. Our biggest difference here is that instead of using the metal oxide, we're just going to use simply magnesium ribbon on its own. But we do pretty much the same thing. So we add it in excess, we filter it, we place it into the evaporating basin and we concentrate it. And once it is saturated, it's taken off the heat and allowed to cool slowly. Cooling it slowly will give us large crystals which is exactly what we want. And we, of course, filter the crystals and we leave them to dry where possible. So the second part of this topic is looking at the theory of acids and bases. Now, you only just touch on this in IGCSE. You do go into a lot more detail about this at A level, but we're just going to go over the kind of basics that you have to know. So acids are substances that will dissociate to form hydrogen ions. And we know this from topic 2F, our acids and bases topic. And, sorry, alkalis are going to dissociate to form hydroxide ions. <clears throat> we get a neutralization reaction happening when this hydrogen ion reacts with this hydroxide ion in order to form water. And the general theory that we have to know are these bullet points down at the bottom. And we call this bronsted lowery theory. And what it means is that our acids are proton donors. So they give away their hydrogen ion. And bases are proton acceptors. So they accept a hydrogen ion. Now let's look at that in practice. If we take the reaction of hydrochloric acid and water, we're going to be looking at what's donating and what is accepting. So the hydrogen ion is donated from the hydrochloric acid into the water. So the hydrochloric acid, of course, is acting as the acid and the water is acting as a base. And we make this atom here, so this ion here, which is H3O+, and this is known as the hydroxonium ion. Again, we don't need to go into too much detail about this at GCSE, but you do need to be aware that this is what we form. When we look at the reaction between ammonia and, and hydrochloric acid, we're going to form ammonium chloride. So again, our hydrochloric acid is acting as the acid because it donates its proton. And the ammonia is acting as a base because it accepts the proton and we're going to form our ammonium and that ammonium ion will bond in with the chloride and we can form ammonium chloride. So let's have a look at a past paper question for this particular topic. So we're looking at the laboratory preparation of salts and the student writes a plan to prepare a hydrated sample of magnesium sulfate crystals. So we want to pour approximately 100 centimetres cubed of dilute nitric acid into a beaker. We add a solution of magnesium carbonate until there is no more effervescence. And we want to heat the solution until all this, the water has been boiled. Now, unfortunately, this student's plan is not going to succeed because there is a mistake in each step. For three marks, we need to identify each of the mistakes and then see if we can fix them. So for step one, we're looking at pouring dilute nitric acid into a 250 centimetre cube beaker. Well, if we're using nitric acid, we're going to form a nitrate salt, but we do not want a nitrate salt. We want a sulphate salt. So nitric acid should not be used. We should be using sulfuric acid instead. And that will give us our sulfate salt. Step two, and we're looking to add a solution of magnesium carbonate to the acid until no more effervescence. Well, the problem with that is that magnesium carbonate, if we think back to our rules, is insoluble. 
So we're not going to actually see our reaction happening here. What we have to do is we would have to use another reagent. Now we're not looking to say what the reagent is. We're simply just looking to say that why the plan will not succeed. And it won't succeed because the magnesium carbonate is insoluble. And step three, heating the solution until all of the water has been boiled off. Well, the mistake is boiling off all the water. The reason for this is we want to make a hydrated salt. So boiling off the water would not make a hydrated salt. We're going to be removing all of the water here and we actually want to keep some of it as water of crystallization. So part B is asking for the student and then mix volumes of aqueous ammonia and phosphoric acid. Describe how the method of crystallization is used to obtain a pure dry sample from this mixture. Now, we don't have to worry about the titration part at the start because it's not asking us how to carry that out. It is simply asking us how do we carry out the crystallization. And we can see that it is worth three marks. So we're going to have at least three points. So the first part that we're going to want to say is we want to heat the solution until crystals start to form. You can also say heat until you form a saturated solution. Then the second part, we want to leave the solution to cool slowly to form the crystals. And then the third part, we're going to have to filter to get our crystals. And that just removes anything that is left over. And then, of course, we need to dry the crystals. And you can mention any way to dry it. So we're looking at an oven or filter paper. So there's our mark schemes for our two questions. And you can check those if you've been able to answer the questions yourself. Please make sure that you have a look at past paper questions for this. You can find a number of questions through different past papers or through different websites. If you have any questions or anything you want to ask about this topic you're not sure about, please feel free to leave a comment below. Hope to see you back on the channel for future videos. And if you have any questions or any suggestions for videos, please, please let me know.